Oh, he's coming through. Good afternoon. Do take a seat if you haven't already. Great. So it's uh, my pleasure to be able to uh, welcome you today if you are rejoining us uh, either in person or online. Our theme for today is the good news that saves. We're going to uh, develop this theme throughout our service today. But there is good news that Jesus has died, he's risen, and he's ascended. Hallelujah? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, along with the worldwide history long church, have died with him and been raised to life and life everlasting. As we consider this theme today, firstly I want us to consider our starting point for accepting this good news as true and therefore worthwhile and of value for all people. Now the world often accuses the church of arrogance because we claim to have the truth concerning life, death, and salvation. This is because they claim that there is no certain truth. The fact that we do not know everything about everything requires uncertainty from their perspective about all that we claim to know. The problem being that this applies to everything that they think, too. Now, there are only two possible solutions to this problem. Firstly, it's to learn all the facts about the universe, look into science, history, the world around us, or even within ourselves, to be sure that no future facts are going to prove those ideas to be false. Secondly, the option is to listen to someone that does know everything about the universe, never lies, and could tell us some things that can never be contradicted. This second solution is what we have when we read God's word his self-declared revelation of himself in Scripture, his word, the Bible. God knowing all things means that we can never discover something new that will contradict his word. Uh, since God does not change, we can be... Uh, since God does not change, we can know the aspects of his character, his will, his promises that he's chosen to share with us through his word, the Bible. Since God is unchanging and cannot lie, therefore his promises, including those for salvation, are eternal. We can have real hope in their truth. In John chapter 17, verse 17, when Jesus prays for his disciples, which includes us from verse 20, he prays, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus does not say your word is true. This is significant for us because God's word is simply not just true. It does not co need to con uh, confirm a higher standard of truth that needs to be discovered. It's true by itself. It is the final standard of truth. And as such, all things that are claimed to be true can be measured by it. In our first song today, Behold the Power of His Word, we will worship the God whose word is unchanging. And every generation can declare that his word is living and sure. In the bridge of this song, we're reminded that we have seen the power of his word in our own lives. These things I've shared with you are not simply facts to be accepted, but we have experienced them with our lives. So let's stand together and praise him. Please do stand. So, Father, as we stand to worship you today, as we recognize the power of your word in our lives and in the world. Father God, we thank you that you are unchanging and eternal, that you never lie. Thank you for revealing your truth to us through the prophets and apostles. Please give us confidence in your promises and in your living word and apply it to our hearts today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you mean? Joel, come on! You know what? Like, why do you all look so 
so glum. Scotland's going to win, that must be it. Yeah, you're all worried that Scotland's going to defeat you. Greatest comeback of the century, that's what I've heard. Come on up, Ben, you can tell me what's happened then. You see, what really happened to me is, um, my name's Mac, right, Mac Anchies, and um, I've come out of a coma recently, as I, a couple of weeks ago, I was so excited for the Scotland game as we were going to trounce the English, that I decided to drive down to the local pub, and I crashed right in right while I was getting me fish and chips, but now you're telling me what, Scotland's not in the Euros anymore. What do you mean? Scotland's not in the... I was so excited to finally be able to, you know, share a bit of excitement. You know, Scotland was finally going to win. It was going to be the greatest comeback ever. If no, nothing. Right, well, that's a little disappointing, isn't it? Well, um, you know what, though? I do have something that I could share, a little bit more of a comeback story. Actually, it's better even than Scotland potentially winning the Euros, although Jim might disagree with me on that one. That's probably why he's not here, actually. He's probably escaped hearing what this children's slot was going to be about. But um, in the meantime, so I've heard, obviously, there's, there's one thing that none of us can beat, right? And that's death, right? When we die, we're gone for good. We've definitely lost. Well, I've heard about someone who's able... He's able to beat death. Greatest comeback ever. Would you like to know who it is? You'd love to know who it is? Well, so would I. Then if you'd like to find out who this person is that's able to do the greatest comeback of all time, even greater than Scotland winning the Euros, then you'll have to ask your children about it after Children's Church this week as we answer that very question and we go across the road and look at the greatest comeback of all time. Uh, so in a moment, then you can go sit back down again. In a moment, uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to head back across the road. So if you've got children who are in year six or below, uh, please line up by the door in a second, and we'll head over. So for now, I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, I pray for all of us as we uh, sit and receive your word today. Lord, I pray for our young people as we head across and we hear your fantastic word as we really dig into uh, the resurrection and how uh, your son conquered death. Amen. Thanks, James. So if you are a child or a parent of a child, um, please do go across to the hall. <laughs> yeah, take my mask off. Thank you. In our first song, we were reminded of our trust in God's promises, his sure and his living word. God has chosen to receive, reveal himself to us through his word. The good news of Jesus is good news because the God who knows all things reveals the truth about who we are and what we need. However, throughout history, the history of the church, there has been false teaching. This has often had to be dealt with. Often this occurs when one characteristic of God is overemphasized to the exclusion of all others. This results in the worship of a false God, which leads to false good news. There are two really prominent examples of this in our context here in the Anlaby churches. Uh, the first one is that God is primarily a ruler or a lawgiver. So people who have this attitude towards God will think that they can be saved if they do enough good and meet the right standard. But one major problem with this is that uh, Romans 3.23 tells us that no one can attain this perfection, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A second example is that God is primarily love, and that people are generally good. In this false good news, a person doesn't need to do anything to be saved from their sin, because they have none. This God accepts you as you are. However, all have sinned 
And the penalty for our death is sin, Romans 6.23. Jesus himself died to pay the penalty for our sins, Romans 5, verse 8. Our next song, You Alone Can Rescue, starts by asking us the question, who, O oh Lord, can save themselves? Hopefully, in our context, nobody's going to answer, I can. The song also further reminds us that it's Jesus Christ alone who can rescue us, that he alone can rescue us from the sickness, the guilt, and the shame of sin. He's the one who lifts us out of darkness, from death to life by his power. It's his grace that enables us to have a personal relationship with God as our Heavenly Father, as the great divide is healed. So let's reflect on these words as we stand and give praise to the giver of life. Jesus. Today's prayers are going to be based on selected verses from Psalm 119. Let's pray together. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your words. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things in your law. Father God, we give you great thanks today for your words. We rejoice as one rejoices in great riches. Lord, you have opened our eyes and regularly we behold wonderful things in your word, the Bible. We are so grateful to you for faithfully speaking to us every day, every week. Please don't stop. May our hearts continue to be good soil and may, you, and may your word take deep root and bear great fruit in our lives. Be good to your servants while we live that we may obey your word for your glory and for our blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. O oh Lord, we are aware of what is going on in schools how young people today are confused and lost in their thinking about gender identity and sexuality. Lies are rife on social media. O oh Lord, we cry out to you for this generation. Firstly, we pray for our Christian young people who attend the Annaby churches. Please, Lord, can you help each of them to stay on the path of purity? May they be convinced as to the beauty, truth, and freedom found in your word. May they seek you with all their hearts, and may they hide your word in their hearts, that they might not sin against you. And secondly, Father, we pray for all their peers and the young people in the Annaby communities. Please, Lord, can you open up a door for us to speak life and light and truth into their darkness? And please, can you prepare the soil of their hearts so that your words would fall on fertile soil and take root and bear fruit, bear fruit in their lives for their blessing and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we pray for all your people across the world who face persecution for following you, Jesus. And we pray for ourselves who may well experience persecution in the, de in the years that lie ahead. We pray that our brothers and sisters in Christ and ourselves may be able to say these words. You are good, Lord. And what you do is good. Teach us your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared us with lies, may we keep your precepts with all our hearts. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but we delight in your law. It was good for us to be afflicted, so that we might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to us than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Do this work in us, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I gave an account of my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Cause me to understand the way of your precepts, that I may meditate on your wonderful deeds. My soul is weary with sorrow. 
strengthen me according to your word. Father, we remember all those we know and love who are suffering in some way. We take some time now to bring them before the Lord in the quietness of our own hearts. Father, for those who are weary with sorrow, please strengthen them according to your word. For those who are laid low in the dust, preserve their life according to your word. Teach them your decrees. Help them to understand your ways. Help them to meditate on your wonderful deeds and encourage them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Eternal Father, you are glorious. You are a rock on which we can depend and we build our lives on the rock of your faithful, enduring word. Father, we cry out to you for our community. Please open doors for the good news about you to be proclaimed in the hearts and lives of many in our community who are building their lives on the shifting sand of our culture. We think particularly of the Little Explorers picnic that is happening tomorrow. Please, Lord, may you bless that time of relationship building and fellowship. Please open doors for the gospel and prepare their hearts that your word might fall on fertile soil and take root and bear fruit in their lives for your glory and for all of our blessing. And as we hear your word being read and explained now, we pray, Father, that you would fill Steve with your spirit and speak powerfully through him. And we pray for ourselves that you would teach us your decrees. May we rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Be good to your servants while we live, that we may obey your word. Open our eyes now, that we may behold wonderful things in your law. And we pray for all these things in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will ever ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. 
But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but God, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Thank you, Janet. Do, um, do keep that reading open in front of you, uh, and um, there is a handout, which hopefully you had on your chair, headed uh, Managing Expectations. Um, <clears throat> as always, do make notes as we go, if that's helpful. Do grab a pen, um, and uh, if anyone has a spare pen, there might be somebody wandering around looking for one, so uh, do pass it on, that would be appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, do take that away and think about it later as well. This four o'clock service at St. Mark started uh, just over, uh, or just under eight years ago. And the group involved at the start did a fair amount of thinking and praying about what we were trying to achieve, uh, what our goals were, mainly based on the writings of um, Tim Keller on church planting. There was one particular thing we didn't really uh, talk about. In a sense, it's my uh, big regret. And it's our theme for today, which is managing expectations. Helping people to see that as we go out in Christian service, the response will be mixed. There'll be positive responses. Uh, there'll be great fruit, but there'll also be rejection, hardship, disappointment. In short, it's hard work. It's a, a roller coaster. And we need to realize this because if we don't, it, it'll be hard to keep going. We might get despondent. We might uh, give up, move on to somewhere easier. Uh, worst of all, we might try to change the message, which tragically many have done over the years to their great loss and ruin. We're drawing to the end of a series of sermons called Equipped, thinking about the life of service as Christians, why we serve, and some of the key Christian truths we need to be aware of. Um, as we serve. And um, if you haven't got one yet, there, are, there is a, a big handout at the back that shows you where we've been. Uh, we're going to close the series with two final truths, truths to share with others, truths to sustain us as we uh, serve. Today we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about managing expectations. And then next week, Adam Young uh, will be speaking on the end times, the return of Jesus uh, final judgment, and heaven and hell. So what expectations should we have as we step out in service? Here's what we're going to see. When sowing God's word, have realistic expectations with confident hope. So first, when sowing uh, God's word. Our main passage is the parable of the sower in uh, Matthew's gospel. We looked at it a few years ago as our uh, series going through Matthew. Um, in verses 1 to 9, Jesus speaks to the whole crowd, uh, telling the, par the parable. Uh, then in the following verses, he speaks just to his disciples. And first of all, he uh, explains why he's teaching in parables. And then in uh, 18 to 23, he explains the parable to his disciples. I'm sure it's a familiar uh, parable to uh, most of us. 
And we can easily form a visual picture in our minds, can't we, of uh, someone going out before the days of tractors with a basket of seed and scattering on the ground. And the seed lands on different types of soil, the path where nothing happens, the rocky ground where it doesn't get established. There's no uh, area for it to, uh, to take root. Thorny ground where it starts growing, but then it gets choked. And good soil where it grows and produces an enormous harvest. And Jesus tells us what the seed is in verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, the seed is the message about the kingdom. It's the word of God revealed in flesh in Jesus Christ, uh, revealed today in the words of the Bible. This is uh, the seed. And the soils are different kinds of responses, different kinds of people. So verse 19, anyone. Verse 20, someone, and so on. So it's worth noticing that as Christians, we are constantly both receiving the word as soil and sowing it as we pass it on. When we hear a sermon right now, each one of us is soil, receiving a seed. Which kind of soil are we? As we read the Bible at home or in a life group, as we read a Christian book, we are soil. And then as we have opportunities to share our faith, as we teach in different situations, we're sowing the word. We were talking about this passage in our staff meeting on Monday, and we noticed how important it is to be sowing God's word. That's the start of the parable. If it's not happening, nothing else is going to happen. And we noticed that there are lots of people in the Anlaby communities who haven't even had the chance to be soil yet. The word hasn't been sown into their hearts. I'm sure there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across Hull who've never had the opportunity to hear God's word in a way they can understand. This is why I'm so excited about the vision for children and youth work that Claire shared at Church Family Night uh, recently. It's why I'm excited about the football ministry, uh, Hull Saints, that the Wood family are involved in. It's why I'm excited about the vision for women's ministry that's developing about the community garden, about uh, the number of evangelists God has given us as a church, uh, about Hull 2030, seeking to plant churches into new parts of the city that don't have any gospel witness. It's why it's exciting whenever I hear of someone who's had an opportunity to speak of their faith with somebody else. It's why, as uh, Claire said again at the church family night, we need to be building low-key, long-term relationships, loving people over the long term. And as a church, we need to be committed to that, walking the road with people. But whether we're a natural evangelist or a leader or a team player, we can all be involved in helping uh, more and more people to hear God's word, for the word to be sown into hearts so they have a chance to respond. And then second, as we sow God's word, we need to have realistic expectations. We need to have realistic expectations. This parable is about people who have heard the word in a way they could understand. And Jesus says there are four different responses, only one of which is ultimately positive. And I've seen each response many times. I'm sure many of us have, and it's heartbreaking. Even when someone seems to have come to faith, they still might not turn out to be at the good soil. Evangelist Rico Tice, who wrote Christianity Explored, says that when someone seems to have become a Christian, he now waits five years before celebrating. And this parable helps us see why. Let's look at the first three responses briefly. At first, I've called in one ear, out the other. Verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. This isn't talking about the good news being badly explained. Sometimes that uh, does happen. I'm sure I've done it. Uh, Sometimes the good news doesn't sound like good news. No, this is when the good news is explained properly, the good news that Chris has been uh, sharing with us through the service. The good news is shared, but the devil snatches it away doesn't mean anything to the person. They don't understand or they don't want to understand. It's 
spiritually, they don't move far past first base. In one ear and out the other. Second, what I've called shallow joy, verse 20. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. This person responds to the message with joy. They seem to become a Christian, but then something bad happens or they're mocked or ridiculed for their faith and they quickly fall away. There's no root. And of course, this is why it's important when we're sharing the good news to help people to think about the cost of following Jesus. It's not plain sailing. It can be at heart. And then third, choked by worldly cares. Verse 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is the most uh, heartbreaking of all. It's the person who responds to the message who seems to be a Christian and seems to grow in their faith. But then there's something else. Something else that becomes more important than God. It's not necessarily a bad thing, maybe a good thing. But a good thing, when it replaces God, becomes a bad thing. Maybe their job, maybe a relationship, maybe their house. And it consumes their time and energy. And it's not sudden, but gradually there's no time for personal Bible reading and prayer. There's no time for church. There's no time for God. And they slowly, gradually fall away from a real living faith. And of course, this is something that we ourselves need to uh, be watching out for. Of all the dangers in the parable of the soils, this is the one we most need to guard against ourselves and to pray that God would keep us from. We need to recognize there will be uh, rejection either immediately or uh, over time. But I want to ask for a moment, can we find deeper reasons to explain this rejection? Obviously, every person is uh, different. But I think Jesus gives us a clue in chapter 11 when he's explaining why he's been rejected by so many of that generation of God's people, God's historic people. So Matthew 11, 16 to 19, he says, To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. But John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, He has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Jesus is saying that for many uh, people, and even for whole generations, when they uh, think about the things of God, they have an agenda. There are certain assumptions about what God should be like, what God should do. Some say, we played the pipe for you, a happy tune, but you didn't dance to it. Others say, we played a dirge, a sad tune, but you wouldn't uh, mourn. Some say, God should be like this. Others say, God should do that. In our current uh, cultural moment, which will seem ridiculous in 20 years' time, I'm sure, people say, I choose to be what I want to be, and God has to bless that. And if God doesn't bless that, I don't want anything to do with God. One person writes, the root is that people seek to master God, to dictate the ways in which God and his grace must go. Of course, we can be guilty of this as well, can't we? When we come across a part of scripture we find hard to accept, what do we do with it? How easy it is to try to to fit God into our mold, to get it to say what we want it to say, rather than humbly sit under what God has to say. And all of this means that at the moment, in our culture, we're, we're starting a long way back. Humanly speaking, we have an uphill climb. Many people don't get past the first stage. The word goes in one ear, it's not considered acceptable, and it goes out the other ear. So we need to have right expectations as we step out in Christian service. As individuals, as a church, not everyone 
will respond positively. But then thirdly, when sowing God's word, have realistic expectations with confident hope. We need to have confident hope. Look at the fourth soil, verse 23. The seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Jesus says there may be rejection, but there will also be acceptance of the message. And when someone accepts the message and and obeys it, they will yield a great harvest. What's the harvest? Well, in the image, uh, it's part of the image, isn't it, of, uh, of sowing a seed. But we've thought before about the fruit that we bear when we remain in Jesus. Obedience, love, becoming more like him, drawing others into relationship with uh, God. And wonderfully, there's evidence of that amongst us. I can think of a number of people in recent years who've responded positively to the message of the kingdom and have, bec- and have uh, borne a great harvest. And I thank God for that. And we can expect more because Jesus promises it. Someone might say, well, why should we have confident hope? After all, if the proportions are right, then three quarters of people reject the message. Seems a bit depressing and discouraging. Well, here are just a few reasons why we should have confident hope. First, there is a positive response. Even one person responding is a miracle And it's truly wonderful. As we know, salvation itself is a gift from God. Coming to Jesus is a gift from God by the Holy Spirit. None of us deserve this wonderful gift of being saved and responding. And of course, we can rejoice that God has worked in us. But as it stands, we appear to be good soil. Second, for those who have rejected the message, uh, who are at present are one of the first three soils, it's not the end of the road. They will keep having opportunities to hear and respond until the day they die. Maybe they'll experience some life event in 5, 10, 15 years' time, which will get them thinking, and, uh, and then they'll prove to be good soil after all. Third, there's no indication in the passage that uh, these are the exact proportions we should expect. Jesus says there are four types of soil, but he's not necessarily saying there'll be an equal amount. And there have been times in history when far more than a quarter have proved to be good soil. I think of uh, Britain after the Reformation. I think of the various revivals over the last few centuries. Hull, 200 years ago, a hotbed of the gospel. And this reminds us, doesn't it, of the great importance of prayer. This is a spiritual matter. Prayer really does change things. And as God prompts us to pray for good soil, so more and more people turn out to be good soil. Fourth reason for confident hope, Jesus has prepared us. He's warned us of the response we should expect. And that means we can be prepared for rejection. I was speaking to a paid evangelist recently, and he said, We so easily worry about being rejected and it stops us from speaking. Remember, Jesus has told us it will happen. And they're not rejecting you and me, they're rejecting him. So don't take it personally. Expect it and get on with it. I found that really helpful. Finally, and most importantly, we can have confident hope because God is still in charge. We see this in verses uh, 10 to 17 where Jesus speaks to his disciples about why he teaches in parables. So let's look at verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. We often think that uh, Jesus teaches in parables 
so that he's easier to understand, don't we? But he says, no, it's the opposite. I teach in parables to make it harder for people to understand, or, or at least so that the person who wants to find out more can by asking, as uh, these disciples are. But on the other hand, the person who doesn't have any desire to understand, they won't understand. Even the understanding they have will be taken away from them. They'll move beyond the parable of the soil and the seed to their own uh, sowing that they need to do next week. So, In other words, even when people reject the message, God is still in charge. In fact, God is still working in judgment. As some people reject the message, he's taking away the understanding they had. Apostle Paul writes this of his own ministry. We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. For the one we are an aroma that brings death. For the other an aroma that brings life. I realize this may raise all sorts of questions and we dealt with some of them a few weeks ago when we thought about the sovereignty of God. But as Jesus speaks to his disciples, this is good news. Good news because they're wondering, why are people rejecting Jesus? Why isn't everyone bowing to their Messiah? And Jesus is able to say it's not because God's lost control. God is working in judgment as well as salvation. And it's good news because if God is still in control, he can do something about it. And we can do something about it. We can pray. We can ask God to change the situation, to increase the number of people who respond positively. We can ask him to do that for his glory. But how much more is God glorified as people submit to him joyfully as Lord and Saviour and treasure? So as we close, three quick questions to think about in the coming days. First, for ourselves, how are we responding to God's word today? Whether we've been a Christian for 30 years or we're hearing the good news for the first time today, will we keep accepting and obeying the word? Second, do we fear rejection? If so, how does today's message help us? And third, will we keep praying, keep proclaiming in confident hope? Just pause for a moment and then I'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you warn us, you explain to us that the rejection that does take place. We thank you that when that happens, it's not because you've lost control. You are still working out your good and wonderful purposes. Help us to not get discouraged. Help us to trust you. Help us to know uh, what to expect. And help us to have confident hope, praying and uh, proclaiming and serving that many more might come to know and to love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. us to consider our response to what he has preached today. And there are many and, and varied ways in which we can do this. Uh, one of our ways is through our worship, um, following the sermon. Um, another way which we're going to share today is through communion. And in terms of our gospel message, although Jesus has uh, died for our sin and defeated death by being raised to new life, we don't receive his uh, forgiveness, his saving forgiveness, automatically. When God calls us to himself um, to bring about this new life, 
he addresses the call to all of a person. He speaks to our intellect by explanation of the facts of salvation. We hear them, we understand them. To our emotions with a heartfelt personal invitation to respond to him. And to our wills by asking us to hear his invitation and to respond to it willingly in repentance and faith. To repent is to decide to turn away from our sins and to receive Christ as our saviour and to rest trusting in him for our salvation. Many of us here today will have taken those steps, uh, either when we were baptised or when we were confirmed. And we go on to reaffirm these truths daily as we seek to live for God's glory and the strength that he provides us in our daily lives. For others here or online, you may not have taken a step like this before. Communion provides us with a brilliant opportunity for, to do this discreetly. Because having heard and understood, there's an opportunity right at the beginning for us to repent of our sins and receive the promise of forgiveness. And that goes for all of us who are continuing in the gospel, not just those who are beginning. In Matthew 11, verses, uh, verse 28 and onwards, Jesus is recorded saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. I want you to encourage you today to hear these words of Jesus as a personal invitation to you right now in this moment for his offer of rest, not only for your immediate future, but also for your soul. There'll be some words that come up on the screen. Do uh, respond to the <coughs> with the words in bold type. The Lord be with you. The Lord is here. Sorry, respond with the words in white. Uh, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross, he died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You send your Spirit to bring new life to the world and clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and his blood. Pour your Spirit on us that we may love each other, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. 
For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus your Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. We should uh, stop. Our next song reminds us of the reality of what has happened because we put our trust in the salvation God offers us. We are spiritually alive because of his sacrifice. We are set free from the burden of sin over us. Guilt is overcome, and the Holy Spirit is at work within us. We were adopted as his children, and nothing can take this from us. Please remain seated whilst we offer our heartfelt praise to our God, our Saviour. One of the great privileges we have um, of being Christians is that we can bring to our Father God the uh, inmost thoughts of our hearts, the things going on in the world, and he's concerned about those things. This week we have two opportunities uh, for us as a church family to do that together. Um, on Tuesday evening, uh, possibly outside uh, on the grass area, uh, we'll be hosting our uh, monthly church family evening where we can join together to pray. Um, if it's raining, there will be an email to tell us uh, the Zoom link, I'm sure. There's also an additional opportunity to spend a bit more time in prayer on our own with our annual uh, prayer day, which this time will be taking place uh, online. And we're asking, as we do in, in normal years, for people to sign up for an hour slot each. Uh, this will be held uh, online, and we can contact Joe in the office uh, if we'd like to uh, be part of that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a financial update here um, about responding to God's generosity, and there was a request that we would uh, increase our giving. And we'd like to celebrate and, but with an announcement that um, since that, um, over £210 per month extra has been pledged uh, with other things to come in as well. So again, just giving thanks to, to you for your generosity in response to our generous God. We've almost come to the end of our time here today. Uh, please do hang around outside and, and chat with us if the weather holds up. And uh, if you're online, please do get in contact with us if there's anything that's been raised today that you'd like to discuss further, we would be delighted to do so. So everything that we have been given in Christ is a gift from God that flows from his generosity and his true character as his word reveals it. So as we close, let's stand and listen to generous King. Let us bring our praise and honor that is due to his name with our whole selves. Please do stand. And I won't come back up to say goodbye, because I've done that already. <laughs>